Test Driven Development with Pester. My name is June Blender. I'm a technology evangelist at Sapien Technologies in Napa, California. I spent some time writing help with the PowerShell team, and I'm now honored to be a Windows PowerShell MVP. Woo. So this is really different than most of the talks that I give, which are which tend to be sort of I know all about this. Here's the syntax, here's how you do this, here are some examples, right? Instead, I'm going to talk about my experiences learning Pester, which is really a different view. And I hope that this will help those of you who don't know Pester to learn it, and those of you who are teaching Pester to have some insight into what it's like to learn it. And this is real world stuff. So I tested the um, code and information on the slides to these versions of Windows and these versions of PowerShell, and particularly Pester 3.4.0. Um, when I started putting together this talk, it was Pester 2, and they're ready to release Pester 4 now. Um, the, the, ver the versions will vary, so this one is 3.4.0. So we talked a little bit in the pre-session about why tests, and I'm going to call it moot. Right? I'm going to say that folks who are here understand why we test, but I'm always happy to entertain discussions. But for a while, even those who wanted to test did not have a professional framework to do so. And then along came Pester. And Pester is really an extraordinary contribution to PowerShell because it's a professional test environment that's built as part of the academic discipline of code testing. The people who built it really knew what they were doing. And rather than developing some helter-skelter test system, they built on the academic discipline of test-driven development. And it's a huge contribution. On it will t when you learn the domain-specific language in Pester, and by domain, I don't mean like domain controller, right? I mean the academic <coughs> discipline of testing. Um, and you go to another language and look at its test framework, it will look very similar and familiar to you. So um, when you see the folks who contribute to Pester, thank them. Buy them a beer, right? It's, it's really an extraordinary contribution. So it says up there that Pester is a BDD style testing framework. So let's talk about that a bit. Test-driven development is decades old. It is certainly not as old as programming, but people like Kent Beck um, and others decided that the way to approach testing is to write the test before writing the code. And this was pretty revolutionary, okay? They said that you write a test, you write only the code that you need to pass the test, and then you go on to the next test. The first time you test that code, it should fail, uh, the, run the test, it should fail because there's no code, right? But you write only the code that you need to pass each test. And in theory, the code is simpler because you've only written enough code to pass the test, everything is tested, sort of a priori. And the developer can be a little more bold because they don't have to worry about regression errors. They can put in a new feature, and if they accidentally break something, the test will pick it up. Behavior-driven de development grew out of test-driven development. And it's the theory that you write tests that describe the behavior, not the implementation of your um, code. Right? So that way you can change the implementation and do novel things without having to rewrite your test suite. It is a really hard thing to do in practice. Okay? I failed, you'll see. Um, but in addition, your tests should be independent of the environment in which they were written. Right? It doesn't have to, you know, the it works on my machine is not a good excuse. Right? And they're also independent of each other. You're testing the code segments in isolation. Um, you should test all of the features and you ship your tests. Your tests become part of your code. But that didn't answer the question of which tests do I write? 
right? I'm supposed to write my test before my code. How do I figure out which test to write? You know, a lot of the tests that I've seen are so easy, right? They're so simple to pass that, of course, the code looks great when you test it. And then you hand it to a real user and it breaks all over the place, right? So there's a, there's a real art in writing tests. And it was about this time last year that I heard Dave Wyatt's talk about Pester. And this was the first question that I hit that I could not solve. So this is where this talk will start. So what I did was to do what Adam Platt calls help-driven development. I started with my help file, right? I used my help file as my spec for my code, okay? It's just an easy way to do it, and it means that I always have a spec. But what I did was I, I realized that my help examples are my, sorry, don't touch the mics. My help examples are my contract with the user about the behavior of my code. Right? And by code, I mean scripts or modules. Okay? And when I make that behavioral contract, I can, I, as part of that behavioral contract, when I write my examples, I show sample output. That's my expected in my test. We're comparing actual to expected. So I, I, run, I show an example of running my code and showing expected output. Um, so it's very easy to use the help examples as the test spec and the test as the code spec. Um, of course, it supports behavior-driven development, and there's a feedback loop because it makes my help better. <coughs> so um, for this, I picked what I thought was the simplest possible little example. Um, I use Windows PowerShell profiles, but when I'm testing or doing demos or writing shared code, I disable them because I don't want something in my um, profile to affect my test or my code. So I had little um, snippets of code all over the place that disabled my profiles and re-enabled them and then would get the disabled profile so I didn't freak out. And that's the little module we're gonna be testing with. So I actually started with a help file. Let me show this to you. We're gonna switch around here. This is PowerShell Help Writer. I showed it last year. Um, and I started with a help file for a get profile, disable profile, and enable profile commandlets. And they all have these nice examples. Okay. And then I went over here to PowerShell Studio. Do I need to use Zoom it? Can you guys see? Yeah. Okay. And I did new, new module from help file. Went to my help files. And there's my module, okay? And so what PowerShell Studio did for me was it just mocked up little functions from my help file, okay? It used the output type because I was careful to specify that, and it gave me a little export module member statement at the end and a module manifest. And quite soon, it will also give you a tests file. So that's basically where I started. Let's get back to this slideshow. Then I created tests for every example. Now I'm going to take you through about seven minutes of syntax. Are we good so far? Everybody happy? Okay. I'm going to take you through about seven minutes of syntax where we're going to where um, we're going to discuss the pester. Um, the Pester syntax and its natural language. You've often heard this called DSL or domain specific language, right? It's just its natural language for comparing actual to expected values. So my, my um, hint to those of you who are learning Pester is to either learn the syntax if that works for you and forget it, or don't even learn the syntax. Just go with the natural language. Okay, and I threw, uh, these slides go up um, on GitHub and they're available to you, so I threw in a little glossary um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the terms. They're not defined in help files. Okay. So describe is a container, okay? And I consider it the naming container. If you look up in the upper right-hand corner, um, there's gonna be a little breadcrumb trail and that's a good thing to work to watch for. You'll see how these pieces interact with each other. Okay, so describe. 
I consider to be, don't touch the mic, I, just, I consider describe to be the naming container. Because when you run invoke tester to run your tests, you, there are test name and tag parameters. And they always refer to the test name and the tag on the describe block. Right? There are other containers in Pester, and they have names. The names are always required, and they are almost always arbitrary. But when you use test name and invoke Pester, it only looks at the, at the names of the describe blocks. So it's my naming container. Um, oh, it creates a scope for both mocking and test drive, and we'll talk about those in a little more detail. And again, the name is required and arbitrary. One more thing, and this gets everybody. See the curly brace that's on the same line as the described keyword? That curly brace, regardless of your favorite curly brace style, is required to be on the same line as Pester because that script block is the value of a positional parameter, right? So if you did put it on the next line, you'd have to use that awful back tick, right? Hopefully without a space following it, right? <laughs> okay. But there's a wonderful error message, and I think when you see it, remind yourself of the value of excellent error messages. There's an error message in Pester. If it can't find the script block, it said, did you put the curly brace on the next line? Uh, okay. it's, a, it's great. It's, it's wonderful. The other thing is that if you omit the, the required name parameter, it assumes that the script block, well, PowerShell, so it's looking for a string followed by a script block. These are all positional parameters. That's how it does the natural language. So if you happen to omit the name, PowerShell converts the script block to a string, and then it can't find the script block. Okay? So if you omit the name, you'll get one of those errors that said, did you put your curly brace on the next line? Right? Even if you didn't. Okay. Context is also a container. Look, keep your eye on the breadcrumbs. It's a container inside describe. It's an optional container. You don't need to use this one, right? They added it for organization, but it's very important because context is the smallest container that creates a mocking scope. There are smaller containers, but they will not contain a mock in Pester 3.4.0, okay? The name again is required and arbitrary. The next container is it. It is a required container inside either describe or context. Um, it encloses your test. It is the <coughs> smallest test container. But it does not contain mocks. It does not create a mocking scope. It also has a name that's required and arbitrary. Should is not a container. Should is actually a function. It compares actual to expected values. Um, you always pipe to it. And it does that comparison based on the value of the B operator that follows it. So this is a very typical should format. And these are all the wonderful comparison operators, OK? Um, they change, so keep an eye on them. Not all of them are documented. I noticed last night uh, B of type, which is one that I use frequently, is not documented. Um, but I owe those guys some favors, so I'll probably throw that in. Um, these are fantastic. Learn these and use them. They will help you in your tests. Oh, and then mock, which is my absolute favorite part of Pester. It lets you fake the input to the commandlet that you're testing. Right? It is absolutely invaluable. I heard some people say that they're using Pester, but they're not using mocking. This is the way that you make your code independent of your environment and independent of code that it interacts with. Okay? And what it does is it fakes the input to the command that you're testing. Okay? So the command that you mock does not run. And instead, you provide the fake output so that when the command that you're testing runs, it gets the output that you specify instead of running that command. So you do not mock the command that you're testing, right? Because it won't run. You mock the command that provides input to your test command. So in this case, you see my cursor? 
Good. OK. So in this case, we're testing new user, right? But we're mocking a, help, a helper function that it calls get user type, OK? And we're going to mock it with admin so that when new user creates its object, it gets admin. I could put anything in there. And one of the things I want to test is all the valid values and at least one invalid value. Okay. Let's see. Oh, and in unit tests, you mock all calls to other commandlets. That's the isolation feature. Oh, we're doing pretty well on time. Good. Mock does not scope to it blocks. Okay. So the mock that's done the mock of get child item in the first it block also affects the output in the second one. The smallest mocking context is, oh, sorry, the smallest mocking scope is context. Okay? Boy, did I learn that the hard way. <laughs> and then test drive, which creates basically a virtual file system just for tests. <coughs> uh, this is something that the Pester team could have made us do as testers, but instead they handled it themselves, and it was a brilliant decision. Here's how it works. Whenever I enter a describe block, I get a brand new test file system that's, that's just for my tests. I can write files in it, I can read files from it, I can change them without affecting the file system on my machine and more importantly, without being dependent on the contents of my personal file system so that it works on my machine. Okay? And what's really going on is that it's creating a temporary drive in ENV10. Right? But so you refer to test drive by as test drive colon, like C colon, right? Always with a colon. Or the test drive variable holds the fully qualified path to the current test drive. Okay, and you'll see me using this when I create paths. Um, you enter a describe block, you get a brand new test drive. You leave the describe block, that test drive is gone. You open a new describe block, you get a brand new one. Okay, so there's no pollution between paths. It was a brilliant move. Again, if you see these guys, you know, pat them on the back. This, this, is, this is a huge facility. Okay. Um, there's some scoping stuff, and we can talk about that if we have some time. In module scope is an Uber container just for testing modules. And what it does is it creates all of the test elements in module scope, which means that the test has access to all of the elements of the module, including the elements that are not exported, right? Like variables and like those helper functions that you need to mock. Okay, so when you're testing a module, this is almost a required thing to use. This one has a required name, but the name is not arbitrary, and it must match the actual module name. Okay. And then the final thing is the wonderful invoke pester commandlet, and uh, let's get to some code. Cool. Can everyone see? Do I need to pop up the font? OK, we're good. Okay. So here's the little module that I created. There is no code in here. This is empty. This is the one that I created from my help file. And here is my first test for it. I'm going to go all the way up here. The rest of this talk is going to be looking at code. So um, I should probably watch the time. Come on, James. OK. So let me show you what one of these things looks like. Pester, very reasonably, cannot handle multiple versions of your test module in the session at the same time. So when you're running, uh, you can use Pester for version 2.0 and later, but when you're running for power, on PowerShell 5, this is absolutely critical. And even if you're not running on PowerShell 5, your users might be, right? So you need to get and remove the mod any all versions of the modules from the session. So that's the first line. And then the second line is to import the version of the module that you actually want to use. And to do this, I always use the required version parameter. Um, your experience may vary. Other people might want to do this in a different way. And then I, because import module returns a non-terminating error, I use error action stop because if it can't find my module, I don't want it to run the test. Make sense? Okay. 
And if you're developing outside of PS module path, the alternative to all of this get module and import module is to use import module with a fully qualified path to the module manifest. Right? That works too. But again, I use error action stop. Um, just to make sure that, and your tests, you know, test this, your tests will run and you don't even have your module or the version of your module that you want. Um, import module um, imports the first version of the module that it encounters, which is usually the first path in PS module path, right? It's a discoverability issue. I do a whole talk about this. Okay, here's my in module scope. Let's get rid of this. Here's my in module scope um, keyword, and it has the name of my module. Okay, structure makes sense? Cool. So the first thing I did, actually that's a lie. The first thing I did was to try to put all, um, all of this set up in my it blocks. And that was just a total mess. So if you have set up to do, you've heard that tests are arrange, act, uh, arrange, assert, and act, right? I, I, do, I do the arrange in a big function, okay? And so basically what I'm doing here is I'm setting up the test drive, and I'm setting up fake profiles in the test drive. And so here are fake profile paths. You can see that there's no dollar sign before PS Home because I'm fooling around in a test drive. Um, I provided a way for me to grab groups of those files that I needed for testing. And at its heart, I take this test drive path. I um, append uh, one of those phony profile paths and do a new item command on that test drive, again with error action stop. Make sense? So that's what I'm doing. And um, it's much easier to do that in a single function than to try to do that in my it blocks. So I'm gonna go back to my help file for a second to the get my get profile commandlet that gets profiles. And I'm actually going example by example, okay? So my first example gets all profiles. It's pretty simple. So here are my tests for it. And you can see that I even use the example name so that I can associate each example with my help file. It just gives me some guidance so that I know which sorts of tests to write. So here's my describe block. And I usually use the name of the command that I'm testing in the describe block. That's just a style thing, okay? Here's my context block. And this is the little, um, this is the internal function that I just showed you that I'm running. I wanna test all profiles. So I test all, and it returns a string because I need to compare strings. One of my experiences was that my tests were breaking because my types did not match, right? I would try, I would say, you know, this input is a file info object, and I expect it to be this string. Well, it fails, right, or vice versa. Right? I'm giving you a string, I expect it to be this file info object. And one of the ways that I was able to get around constantly making these errors were to make the output type on the functions that I'm testing explicit by using the output type attribute so that I always know what the output type is. So in this case, I needed a string. So I'm testing get profile and I'm mocking a helper function that does not exist at this point. I have no code, that file is empty. But I realized that if I want to mock the paths, I need to have a helper function or something that provides those paths to the function that I'm testing. Okay. So normal, I end up, when I test, I end up with more helper functions than I normally would if I wrote the code without using the test-driven development process. Okay. Um, but it makes the code very modular. It, it's actually very nice. So I'm mocking something that doesn't exist. Here's my get profile call. And so the first part of it gets all profiles, and the second part gets only profiles. 
And this is a this is a pattern that I use a lot. I'm creating some fake stuff that's similar to those. I'm trying to make it hard for myself. And I make sure that they're not there by doing some counting. Okay? And when I run this, I'm just going to run it in the console here. It will fail because I have no code. Okay? Yeah? It looks like <clears throat> your test may be requiring something that you're not wanting, that you're not specifying. You require it to come back in a particular sorted order. Right. I sorted them. Okay. Yeah. You want that. okay. Yeah. They're sorted. See the sort object on get profile? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Thanks. Okay. So, so this failed because there was no code. So I'm going to close this and grab the next version. The test file is virtually the same. I'm going to put it over here. It helps me to have my code and test side by side. And here's my little get profile path helper function. And only the code that I needed in get profile to pass that test, which was a call to the get profile path helper function and a get item. Okay? So this time, when I go back and run that test, it passes. You see that? I'm going to do that again. I'm going to restart the shell and run it again. So that's basically the process. I take my examples, I convert them into tests, I run the test, the test fails, I write the code. So let me show you what happens after a little while when it gets a little more complicated. So here's my test code for the disable profile commandlet. Let's take a look at the examples for just a sec. My first example gets the current user, current host profile. That's really easy because it's not in the system32 directory. My second example is the tougher one. And this is a decision. This is a design decision that I needed to make when I wrote my spec or my help file. What do I do if, I can't, if there's something that I want to disable that I can't disable because it's in system32, right? And so the design decision that I made was that it should disable what it can and write a non-terminating error if it can. And this is the example that shows that. Okay? And you'll see the tests that show it as well. And then the last one just shows that if you have no profiles, there's no output and no errors. And here are the tests that I wrote. You'll get all this code. But here are the tests that I wrote to test that. This is the ones for get profile. Let's close those. And here they are for disable profile. Okay. Notice that when I'm testing disable profile, I'm mocking get profile. Okay. Disable profile is going to call get profile to get the profiles to disable. And I never want a problem in get profile to make my test for disable profile fail. Okay? So I always want to mock any commandlet that's in my module. Okay? So the first one disables the um, disables all the user profiles. And then the second one turned out to be quite tricky. Okay? So in the first case, I have multiple contexts for this because I'm using multiple mocks. But the first test, I tested with um, System32 profiles in a non-admin session. And you'll see that I ran disable profile. I converted my non-terminating error to a terminating error with error action stop. And I used the should throw operator to test it because it should generate an error. Now, in the module, or um, when I run it, it's a non-terminating error. But here, in order to use should throw, I just made it a terminating error. OK? Good trick. OK? Then I tested the same System32 profiles in an admin session. It should not throw, and it should disable them. And then in the third case, I used all profiles in a non-admin session. And you'll see that 
some of them should error out and some of them should actually be disabled. And here's that last test case where it's no profile, so I'm mocking get profile with null, and when I run disable profile, my output should be null or empty. And it doesn't write an error. Even if I use error action stop, it should not throw. Okay? And I'll run this and I promise you that it works, unless it's a demo. <laughs> Okay. Any questions about the structure or content of these tests? Yeah. So you've got that it should not grow. Does that imply that if it had grown and you hadn't said that, that would still be a pass? Uh -huh. Well, it, so I would see the non-terminating errors, but unless I was watching the test run, I wouldn't see it, right? Because it's going to go to the error stream instead of the output stream. Right? So if I'm taking my test results and saving them somewhere in a file, I would miss that. Questions? Other questions? How are we doing on time? Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So some time passed, and I continued to write these tests. And I realized that I might, because this is the files, the Windows file system, I needed to do integration tests in addition to my unit tests. And this is just because I didn't trust my own, you know, funny mocking of the file system. Okay? So what I did was I took the test file that I'd been working on and I just renamed it to .unit.tests. Okay? And then just to make it easy for myself, when I when I wrote my describe blocks, I changed it to get profile unit test and get profile integration test. And I added a unit test or integration test tag so that I could run those separately. Okay, this is, these are just structural. The code was the same. And then I wrote some integration tests and I want to show these to you. Okay. I got rid of that great big function that creates that virtual world for me. And here's that get profile test, but as an integration, it's an integration test, so I, ha I use in the real enable profile to enable the profiles. Um, I have a get expected profile that goes and looks for profiles on the system. I'm actually running get profile and disable profile on real profiles in the real file system. Okay. And this made me feel a little bit better. It did not follow the academic model, but it satisfied me that, I'm actually, that the things that I'm doing actually work in the real file system with admin permissions and without. And the other thing I did on these integration tests was that I put a pound requires run as administrator at the top so that I could test the admin parts. Okay. I'm testing the non-admin parts in my unit test. Any questions about this or the structure? Yeah, Adam. The pound requires run as administrator. What does anything parse that, or is that just a comment? Oh, I'm sorry. That's that's part of PowerShell, yeah. um, oh, and you can put it on any script. Yeah, the, there are a couple of different pound requires in my um, version chaos talk. I was talking about pound requires dash module, right? And it does. There's pound requires dash version for the PowerShell version. There's pound requires dash module for um, dependent modules. And you can, this is a different talk, you can actually use a module specification object in your pound requires dash module to require a specific version of a specific module with a specific good. So, yes. Very cool stuff. So now I have integration tests as well as unit tests. Um, and I can. Let me run them actually for you. I'm going to copy the file path and run as administrator. Okay. Never trust yourself to type when you're doing a demo at a major conference. Okay. And it should run them all. Have I forgotten anything? Don't think so. Look at all of those tests for those simple little commandlets. Now, one of the reasons that there are this many tests is that for each thing I did, I did an enumeration of the files, of the 
um, file paths that it returned, and then I did a count to make sure that I got all and only the ones that I expected. Okay, and that's because PowerShell doesn't do a great job of comparing arrays with arrays, right? Anyone who's ever used Get Unique, right, will recognize that. And Pester, because it's PowerShell, doesn't do a great job of comparing arrays to arrays. But in version 4 of Pester, there's going to be new array comparison features. And I should be able to cut the number of tests here in half, right? And just test, you know, be able to compare arrays to arrays. Okay, and that will be a huge change. But again, that's why I specified that I'm doing 3.4.0, Pester 3.4.0. Okay. And fortunately, everything passed, okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, oh, I'm going to do it on a different set. I'm going to grab this next set. Let me show you. We have a couple of extra minutes. So I'm actually going to show you something cool. I didn't think I would get to show this to you, so I'm a little jazzed. This is a great lesson, and this is actually real life. So I'm going to do Invoke Pester. Whoops. Do not type during major talks at conferences. Copy the folder path will do it. Okay. Great. And now I'm going to use the code coverage parameter, which is fantastic. And it shows you um, code that did not get run during the tests. So it helps you write your tests. Um, because it tells you where, you the, where you've missed code. And you want to run, it requires a file name, and you always want to run it against your script file or module file, not against your test file. You don't want to test the code coverage in your test file. You want to test the code coverage in your module file. So this actually happened to me. This is real life. Okay, I had my unit tests and my integration tests, and I thought I was really covered. So let's see what happens. The output is at the very end. Okay. And it shows here that my code coverage was 97.5%, which for people like me is a failing grade. <laughs> <laughs> and what it showed me is that I'm missing a right warning. I'm missing a... Um, what I interpreted to be a test for a warning that I put in, right? And I cheated. There's no example for that warning, but I put the warning in because I kept forgetting that when I change my profile in one session, because those profiles are loaded when the session starts, I need to remember to restart the session to make the profile changes effective. But I did not put that in my examples, and I didn't test, and I thought I got caught, okay? But I didn't. Let me show you what was actually happening. Note that this is on line 172. Okay? And I'll go back to my code and I'll go to line one, whoops, delete 172. Can you see what's going on here? I'll scroll up just a little bit. I did a cut and paste. Wow. No one ever does that. And I pasted my code outside of my function. Of course it wasn't running. Okay? But if I grab this code and paste it back inside the function and save, and I run that same test again, Sadly, I get 100% and I don't deserve it. <laughs> code coverage means the code ran. This parameter does not say test coverage. It's code coverage, right? So a code coverage of 100% means that during those tests, every line of code ran. It does not mean that every line of code was tested. Okay, big lesson, important one. Does that then mean that the, the code coverage is really making sure that you haven't end up mocking something and then never actually not mock it? That that would be one way to to look at it. Yeah. So JB very brilliantly um, suggests that what we do is use code coverage to make sure that we're mocking things so that 
it should show up in code coverage to use it in a positive way. So I should see, like, if I'm mocking get profile and I'm running only my disable profile test, that get mocking doesn't run. And I think the only thing I need to test that, the only thing that might happen is that if I only run my disable profile test, it might not um, look at get profile at all. And also, it might recognize that it mocked. Right? There's a great command called assert mock verify, which means that even if the mock um, doesn't do anything obvious, it, it um, lets you know that it was called. Okay? So there's my little code coverage slide in case we didn't get to do this demo. Okay? So when you test modules as opposed to scripts, you use the in module scope container which means that you can mock any function. It can't handle multiple versions, so make sure to use that get module, remove module. Oh, if you just use remove module without get module, and there are no modules in there, it throws a non-terminating error. Okay, but if you use get module and then remove module, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it's nice. And then write separate tests for all of your nested modules because they're not automatically tested, right? But you just, um, give it the fully qualified path to the module. So, a couple of conclusions. It took a really long time to do this. It was my first one. I have since written more tests for things that I actually have in production code, and it went much snippier, okay? So, it took a really long time, but so did my first decent script, okay? It's a learning process. And I think you really need to look at it in the long run, not in the short run, right? So you don't base, you know, how many times, how much time a test takes on somebody who's doing it for the first time, right? That's a ridiculous measure of efficiency. So I think that in a year or so, when people get really good at writing tests, we'll have a better, we'll have better metrics for, for how efficient this process is. It was much too easy for me to assume when I hit a bug in my test that it was a pester bug, okay? This is a system in development, and I did find a couple of pester bugs. They were pretty minor. Most of the time, they were my bugs. They were logic bugs. Um, in this code, I have a for loop, right? And my for loop would not run. You can debug these files, too. Just run the test files, run them through your debugger. And I could watch in my debugger, watch it skip that for loop. So, you know, I went up to Dave Wyatt and I said, your code doesn't have for loop. I had set my for loop up um, to run while the value of a certain array, right, the index was less than the value of a certain array, and there was nothing in my array, okay? It was, so really, don't assume that these things are pester bugs. Take responsibility. Um, I found them to be most valuable for regression testing. So. Um, in production, I have a system that runs fairly frequently and gathers some files. And I change it a lot because my boss always wants me improving my code. Right? And this is wonderful for catching unintended side effects. So normally, when you test a new feature, you test to make sure the feature works. And this automatically tests to make sure that your new feature didn't break other features that your users depend on. Um, the output type became really important to me. I have learned to use that output type attribute and to include it in my documentation. Um, and it makes my writing, mocking, and tests much simpler. It avoids a lot of mocking and test errors. Amen. Yes. <laughs> um, the errors should be explained in the help file. Okay? That's a really important thing that I didn't, I didn't realize how important it was for me to document errors and not have my users try to figure out what errors they might encounter, okay? And then the final thing is that every module should have at least one test file. Um, this talk was reviewed by Dave Wyatt twice. He looked at all the tests and all the code and all of the slides. And I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the people who went before me, including Jakub Yaris and Mike Robbins, who wrote great um, articles about Pester. Um, we're celebrating 10 years of PowerShell. And these are the people on the PowerShell team who've been there all 10 years at Microsoft. 
And this was real world test driven development with Pester. So thank you for coming. <laughs>